Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dentistry Unmasked. I'm Pam Maragliano Munez, Chief Editor for Dental Economics, and with me as always... Hey, David Rice, Chief Editor at Dentistry IQ. And Pam, they say that one bad apple spoils a bunch, so I'm kind of excited for our guests and our topic today. Oh my gosh, isn't that the truth? So yeah. I'm going to start by introducing our guest, but then I have to tell you a story. Unfortunately, a true story, but a story nonetheless. So welcome, Bill Prescott. You must know his name if you follow DE at all. He's been contributing to DE well before me, well before Chris, and oh my gosh, well before Joe Blaze. So Bill, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I love having a face and a voice to match all of the articles that you've contributed. So, and I, when I had this happen to me in my practice, I was like, all right, I need to talk to a friend and you were my person. So, okay. Do it's it. early in the year. <laughs> Once upon a time in December, I planned a holiday party for my team and I was super excited about it. And I thought it was going to be great. And, you know, in general, it was great, but then it wasn't. And it really all revolves around alcohol consumption. So without sharing too many details, because at the end of the day, you know, what happens there stayed there. But um, feelings were hurt. Things were said. Things were done. Things happened that just kind of made my awesome team that had so much cohesion before that weekend, kind of have like an elephant in the room and hard feelings going into that following week. And so that was a problem just by itself. But also, I can't help but think, all right, I'm the unfortunately the ringleader of all of this crap. <laughs> and um, what am I liable for, even though it's my party, but I'm not the one pouring shots in people's mouths. So, I mean, where does that, you know, is there a line there and what am I responsible for? So help me, Bill. Well, unfortunately, employers are responsible. And, you know, even at our firm, we have two drink, uh, two drink maximum for holiday parties just because of liability purposes. And, you know, all it takes is one, one person in the room be it the employee or a spouse or someone to create a problem. So employees are liable for employer sponsored events. And that's the kind of thing that should be covered in the employee manual, which is a very comprehensive and changing document uh, based on the particular laws of the state. Not every state's different too. And, and that's why the employment lawyer has to should be in the state where the practice is located. Um, as to the potential liability, because it's an employer-sponsored event, anything that goes wrong has to be addressed in the employee manual and uh, dealt with with the employee on a disciplinary basis. Um, and when and the other thing is about employee manuals, they have to be continually updated when the law changes. So it's a changing document because employee employment laws do change. But there's more liability on employers uh, than ever before. So it really comes down to addressing what happened, uh, making sure it doesn't happen again, and keep your fingers crossed that it that it does not. But I like the you know maximum of two drinks, because at least you know that the employee wasn't given uh, alcohol sponsored by an employer event for more than two drinks. So if they got inebriated, it wasn't wasn't from the employee employer sponsored event. So that's an important component. The other thing is, is driving, impaired driving. If somebody drives and gets in an accident and they were inebriated, uh, that's, that's a, certainly a a potential problem and liability. And the other thing now with all the state marijuana laws changing, many states, including here in Ohio, which I didn't think would happen, <laughs> is that um, you've got people that are smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol at the same time, and that's not such a good match. And then trying to drive on top of it. So that's uh, that's the way it is. When I was in high school, people used to go to jail for smoking marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a whole new world. It's crazy. So what can happen? So say 
somebody gets drunk and you know things go you know awry or whatever can they sue the dentist like so say they get into a car accident because they drank too much can they sue their boss for what took place like how does like what does that even look like well what it looks like unfortunately is that the let's say there's a sexual harassment claim um, and this did happen in, in in the case I'm aware of. Um, the employee sued the person who made the advances as well as the employer and got a pretty big settlement. So it's it's a yeah, it's a potential liability. Now there are, are types of insurance riders uh, that can be obtained to limit, employer liability for employees, but I wouldn't rely on any kind of insurance policy uh, at all. And if you do have any insurance that covers employee matters, you want to know what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Because, you know, the, the best thing is a, a good course of action and you have a good effective disciplinary policy in effect and just not put up with, with um, inexcusable behavior. So I, I'm going to come back to that two drink limit because I think that's a really great example. If, if we as practice owners have the, the, the proper HR manual and we have a two drink limit and we're at a social event, a holiday party, you know, where we started today and somebody kind of gets drunk, gets over the top. Does, does that cover us because it then becomes their own personal liability and what they've done on their own? Cause we've, we've made, we've taken a strong stance. Well, it's a good defense, you know, it's not bulletproof, but it's sure going to help. And it's better than, you know, no limits and no dealing with the discipline policy or no employee manual that addresses it. So you want to, you know, do everything you can to throw hurdles in front of any potential liability. Sure. So if I could relive this day, so this, the restaurant that we had, our party was at a place where you could just like leave the restaurant and have like cocktails or something after. So there's the potential for an after party. And that is what took place. So if I had my little party, everybody had two drinks or less and the party's over, should I, as the practice owner, leave the establishment at that point and say, Hey, good question. You know, that's sort of like we're clocked out, party's over, do what you want to do after, but I'm not going to be part of it. Or if I stay, does that inherently mean that I'm still part of this debauchery? I think staying means that you're part of it. You know, it's uh, the good defense is party's over and we're adjourned here. And, uh, and if somebody wants to go out and continue to have, and I, you know, evening on the town, that's their business, but shouldn't be yours. You don't want to make it yours. And I'm not against, you know, having a good time and, you know, all of that, but you don't want your, you don't want the liability for you or your practice as a result of it. Is there, I'm sorry, is, so is there sort of a statute of limitations on things like this? So I don't know. You you have way more experience, obviously, with practices going through this. But I kind of think in my head that sometimes things happen and they sort of get swept under the rug. But then a year later, two years later, three years later, maybe a team member gets unhappy about something else. And then they start digging up something that happened in the past. Is there a point in time where they can't go back digging to a holiday party where somebody went a little over the top and then offended them and pull that in? Good point. Uh, there are statutes of limitations in every state for this kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't know if they're all, they're probably not all the same, um, but you raise a good point that, you know, somebody, uh, let's say an employee fires himself because employees should know if they're not doing the job, they're not going to be there. So this employee fires him or herself and brings up this event two years ago that occurred as, well, you know, don't fire me or I'm going to bring up this claim. Sure. And, and you know, my view is, well, if you want to bring it up, bring it up now, you know, and we'll deal with it. But 
you're still not going to be employed here. So that's a, that's a very real issue. So this is holiday parties. So I think that there's other events where it's an employer sponsored event. So I know I've tried a couple of times to bring people to CE courses and you know, that, I mean, as a practice owner, I hate to say, it, and I do love my team. Everybody knows that I kind of always leave these things a little disappointed. And I always feel like it's because of alcohol or the perceived vacation as opposed to learning and all of that. So this year I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm bringing CE in and I'm going to have somebody here in my office teaching us what I want us to teach. And then everybody can go home at the end of the day. And that's where it is because this is where I've been pushed. So, but there's plenty of people who take their team on a destination or, you know, even if it's into, you know, the, you know, nearby major city or your local dental show or whatever it is, they're bringing their team there. Where's the liability there? Well, because the staff is brought to the continuing education event by the doctor or the practice owner, there is liability. You know, uh, the good uh, you should be paying staff members for the continuing education courses they're required to take on behalf of the practice. So they're really on the clock. And you know, particularly with a specialty practice where there's referral sources, you want to make sure that the staff members at all time are acting responsibly. But, you know, that it reflects on the practice if somebody's acting uh, out of line. And uh, that should also be part of the uh, discipline policy uh, considered in the employee manual. So, okay, I have to chase a squirrel. What if we go, because, you know, our practice, we take these trips all the time. And I'm going to say, you know, by, we're, I'm going to say we've matured as a team. So if we, if we rewound the clock 20 years ago, thank God it was 20 years ago. Cause <laughs> if I'm honest, we all behaved poorly and myself included, but different time, different era, we're, we're past that. So now, you know, we're all in our like fifties and we've, kind of grown up together. We're, we're, we're more low key. We're, we're more apt to go for a great dinner and have two cocktails and tuck ourselves in. But what about things that are sort of outside of our control? Like we're in an Uber and somebody like T-bones us and they're on our clock. Like, how does that work? Is that, is that a totally different subject? Is that fallen in line with any of this? I think it's, uh, really out of the ordinary, that kind of a situation, somebody gets hit in an Uber or cab or something, that isn't anything that you can control from the practice or anything that, you know, that should have been dealt with with your policy. So that's, I think, a separate a separate matter. Okay. But the things that are within the, within the control and to say, you know, you can't, as an employee, staff member, you can't act like an idiot. And here's, you know, here's the guidelines. Here's what we expect. And we expect you at all times to be acting appropriately. And, you know, yeah, you have to get up and go to the meetings and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's a very, you know, very, uh, I think that that falls outside of the liability of the practice would be my view. Okay. I, Pam, I have a question for you. Hit me. How do you balance this culture and camaraderie with limitations that we kind of need to have at whether it's, you know, a CE event where we're going someplace together or a holiday party. So here's my sense and Bill, you can chime in and be like, Hey, you are just out of line. I feel that when you have a relationship with anybody, whether it's my husband, my friend, my team, like a really true relationship, a friend, you should be able to share the good and when you're going to give them a pat on the head, but also when things are not good. And so I feel pretty confident and I've already expressed my, my disappointment in this, you know, this event that took place. I feel that as the owner and just as a person that has an interpersonal relationship with my team, I should be able to express my disappointment and say, this is not representative of what this practice is about. And as a result, I'm getting pushed to, I don't know, 
freaking paint night or something like that. Like, I'm going to take <laughs> you, we're going to draw a picture and you're going to go the freak home because this is where I'm getting, you know, this is where I'm getting put in this position. Honestly, my best holiday party was when I had a team member who was under legal drinking age and I said, I'm not serving alcohol. So if you want to go mm -hmm. get your own drinks, you can go pay for it. And oh, how about that? Everybody didn't act a fool. So I think that, um, you know, she's in college now, so now I don't have her as an excuse. So I feel like um, I explained that this is, you know, this is disappointing for me. This is outside of what my expectations are. And, um, you know, if it doesn't shape up, then we're just not going to have a party. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, but it's going to be, a you know, basically a progressively toned down event until it goes away. And if it goes away, it's because not because of me sure how about how about that bill if 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 we host an event it's alcohol free but people have the option to buy their own alcohol where does how do we sit with that if people have that option i still think there's a possible liability potential liability if it's an employer sponsored event but i really you know in, enjoyed the last comment from pam that's called leadership you know, it's so important to have a vision of your practice and understand what your practice is and have your, you know, your strategy of how, where you're going in, in life and, and be a leader. And the, the best practices have leaders as owners and, and, and they're the happiest owners that I know because they're leading, you know, rather than being led and rather than being confused by their own lack of policies and, and lack of leadership. So the leadership, I think, is a crucial, crucial role. I will say one thing that I thought was really great was we did have to have a sit down after this event. And um, it kind of revolved mostly around one person, more or less. And so it was really nice that when we sat down, she was like, I was going to sit you down if you didn't sit me down. And I was like, oh, OK, good. And so I felt really encouraged that she felt comfortable enough had I not just pulled her um, and I had to let it kind of wait a few days because I picked the day to talk where there's the fewest people in the office. So it was just a little bit quieter and a little less crazy. So, you know, she had a couple of days to kind of let this marinate before we actually sat down and spoke. And I appreciated that she said she was going to sit me down if I didn't sit her down. And so, number one, I'm glad I beat her to it because I feel like as a leader, I should be you know, kind of starting that conversation. But I also appreciate that she felt comfortable enough to say, I was going to talk with you because I'm not comfortable. So, you know, I think all's well in the world, at least in my office, but, you know, not everybody is that lucky. And I think things can happen. And I think that can be pretty awful when it does. I want to also touch more about transportation. So I know, I don't think any really offices compensate their team for driving to and from the office, right? But then all of a sudden now it's, okay, this is not really the office, but we're driving to a party or we're driving to a CE. And now all of a sudden there's part of this. Should we be compensating our team for parking or for, you know, anything associated with the travel to get somewhere? Obviously if it's a flight, that's a little different, but I feel like driving, instead of driving 30 minutes to my office and you're driving 30 minutes to Yankee Dental, where's my liability there? I don't see the liability for the driving in that case, but if it's a, if the employee is being asked to drive out of state, for example, you know, two hours instead of 30 minutes, well, I think that's compensatory. And I'd err on the side of, of compensatory. Uh, flights, you know, if somebody has to fly somewhere, that's you know, I, would, I would suggest paying them for that too, uh, for staff members. So I had something happen and it was interesting because I had, it happened twice and it, the outcome was two different things. So I was going to take my team on a CE and I did, but, um, and it required a flight. And so I had two people quit before the trip. And so I had already purchased tickets for them. So the one person led with, I know you already bought me this ticket, just, you know, I know how it works because you can't really get a refund and it's like all gone. So like they'll get a credit on their 
flight account or whatever. So she said, look, on my last paycheck, just take the flight out of it and let's just call it a day. And I thought that was fair. And I was like, all right, cool. So the next person, I was like, you knew going that, that we were going to do this. And now I have the cost of this flight that I had to eat. And she threatened to sue me if I didn't just eat it. I think the answer to that is, you know, what kind of refund did the airline have? You know, so they, will, have gotten, they don't give you this, your money back. They'll so like if I bought you a flight, say I buy you a Delta flight and you don't want to and you don't go. So what happens is the two hundred dollar ticket is a credit for your personal use for in the future. So I don't actually get that money back. So it's almost like you know, you bought a flight, you didn't use it, but now you have this credit to use in the future. My gut instinct on this is that there's not much you can do with a second employee, even though they would have gotten credit for that ticket. What I would suggest is refundable tickets or have the ticket go to the practice account, uh, the employer's account. And if an employee quits in the future, that the practice gets the credit as opposed to the the staff member. You know, I think, you know, the staff members, former me staff member would argue, well, I'm not going to use that Delta ticket. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to use that $200 credit or 500 whatever it was. So I think that would be a little, that, that's that's a tougher one. The first one I think took the high road and uh, that was very, that was very kind of her. And I think the right thing to do. I agree. Yeah, it was a small price to pay to make employee number two go away. So I'm not yeah. sad about it. It's fine. <laughs> so I think you've given us a bunch of really great pearls. Do you have any other recommendations of things that maybe we didn't talk about that we should consider when it comes to, you know, being able to, you know, to play host, appreciate our team, but also do it in such a way that we're not potentially setting ourselves up for liabilities. Uh, yes, I do have a, a few of these, which I, I wrote down last evening and it came out a number I liked. It was a round number 10. So it's all right. Love it. Uh, I have to put on the readers for this one. The, um, money isn't everything, number one. Um, but it's becoming more of a problem than it ever has been. And job security is very, very important, but that's less important than it's ever been, particularly with COVID and all the craziness that's going on. I see, you know, staff being hijacked by other practices and people not wanting to work. And it's not only in dentistry, you know, and in, in its specialties, but it's in everything. You know, it's in hotels. It's uh, you know, ever had a flight canceled and you couldn't get home because of the, the flight crew couldn't get there and didn't get there, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, restaurants. I know restaurant owners that, you know, can't find staff members to keep the restaurant open on a full time basis. And, you know, there's some great restaurants around the country that, are open now from Wednesday to Saturday instead of, you know, seven days a week like they used to be, all because of staffing. So it's, you know, it's job security isn't that either. But one of the things is, is appreciation for work. You know, somebody does a good job. Hey, you did a great job. Thank you very much. And, and that's really appreciated by staff members. And, and uh, you know, fortunately, our firm is, you know, with about 70 people, we have a very very long standing group of people here that have you know been here many many years and uh, you know when when I've been here 35 years and my paralegal has been here longer than me what does that tell you you know these are all great people and, and what what's important not only is it money and the bonuses and that kind of thing but it's you know, appreciation for great work and that comes through leadership um item 2 well, that was really too is appreciation for meaningful work and and, and benefits. Another thing on the you know the compensation is consider adopting a four hundred one k plan 
401k profit sharing plan. You know, it's good for the practice owner and, and then the other docs, but it's also, you know, great for staff, particularly the profit sharing plan. They can put up to 4% of their pay as a, as a country to their own contribution in, into the plan in the 401k plan. And it gives them something for the future. Cause a lot of people just can't afford to retire. They get to a point in time where, you know, maybe the spouse, their spouse has, uh, retirement plan, but you know they haven't saved, and it's just tough out there. So I think instituting a four hundred one k plan is not only good for the doc, the doctors, but uh, also great for the staff. Uh, Want to make sure people have medical benefits somehow. Uh, that health insurance, is particularly now, is very very important, and more of a, a global thing. Develop a, a mission of your practice, a vision. You know, I tell you know the dentists I teach that are in, in school, dental school or residencies, you got to have a vision. You know, if, if you can, if you can dream it, you can do it. And uh, me being a lawyer is the pipe dream. I couldn't do that. I did it, but it was a vision. And if you have a vision of your practice and what it's going to be like, it may have to zigzag and go through a number of hoops to eventually get there. But if you got that vision, you're going to get there. If you can dream it, you can do it. And I think that's important. And it, it rubs off on the, on the staff. Uh, another thing is job design versus job descriptions. There's a lot of discussion about job descriptions and who's doing what and crossover training and that kind of thing, particularly in the smaller practices with fewer than more employees. But job design is... But job description is you answer the telephone. Job design is here's how you answer the telephone. You call our firm, you're going to get same, not the same person answering the phone, but you're going to get the same, same greeting by everybody because they all answer the same. Same thing with the practice. You know, it shouldn't matter who answers the phone, but it certainly matters what's said, particularly with the first person that's you know that the patient speaks with or the referral source. The um Idea of practice management is, you know, there's good practice managers and consultants, and there's some that aren't so hot, um, like anything. But good management systems or good practice management can help your practice systems. It's very important to develop systems in your practice that work, that you don't have to think every time you do something. And it's not easy to develop those but it's, it's very, very essential. Um, and that's how your, your practice runs smoothly so, that, so you can treat patients on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, next one is more legal than anything, entity maintenance. You know, you're trying to protect yourself against liabilities. Be a corporation, an S corporation. Uh, you don't want to be a C corporation anymore due to double taxation, but uh, S corporation or a limited liability company and maintain the entity records on a regular basis through your, through your uh, attorney. And uh, that's, uh, you know, the employee works for the entity, not for you individually. If you are a sole proprietor, not a, not a, a corporation or limited liability company or limited liability partnership, whatever, given the state you're in, um, the, the entity does provide liability protection in, in the event of, of a liability claim. You know, it's not bulletproof, but it's, it's certainly better than nothing. And we've already spoken about this, this importance of state laws. Um, you know, you don't want to take employee manual that was written by somebody in one state when you're in another and it's not even written by a lawyer, you want to really, you don't want a canned product. You want something that is really going to effectively help you. And maintain the employee manual. You know, if an employee manual is not maintained and laws change, then the practice is potentially liable for not following its own policies. And you got to follow your own policies. Practices continually you know, have owners that are afraid of dealing with problem employees. But the problem with not dealing with problem employees is that the employees that do a really good job get discouraged. 
So you got to deal with the problems and whether you like it or not, but that's, that's part of the leadership. And lastly, treat everybody the same. You know, it's pretty simple. It's not easy to follow, but it's pretty simple. Treat everybody the same. I love it. I love that so much. Those are some serious pearls at the end of this. So thank you so much for sharing your candor and sharing your expertise with us because I think even my cat loves it. I think that, <laughs> um, you know, this is a conversation that we don't really love having, but it's important for us to have. And it's important for us to know that, you know, we should be always behaving the way we would behave in our practice in front of our patients, the way we should, you know, when we are inside or outside our four walls. So Bill Prescott, thank you so much. And I can't wait to read what you write for us next in next month's DE. So <laughs> thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Amazing. David, as always, a pleasure. And everybody out there, can't wait to see you next week. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening to the show this week. And thanks to our guests and sponsors on this episode. Please check out our social media at Dr. Pamela underscore Miragliano and at Dental Economics Official. Or you can check me out at Ignite DDS or at Dr. David Rice. And go to dentaleconomics.com to receive dental economics. You can choose to receive DE in print or digitally, and you can also get the details of our Principles of Practice Management Conference on our website. If you have top Topics or guests or anything you'd like to talk about on the show, send us an email to dentistryunmaskedpodcast at gmail.com and we will do our very best to make it happen. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.